I love the fact that we can, you know, I'm, I'm still parking on this whole Thanksgiving service and what happened at Thanksgiving and just hearing the testimonies. And we know there's a few other testimonies that haven't yet reached our social media platforms. You haven't seen it yet. But I praise God that we can share testimonies. Let me just say testimonies are very important in our Christian walk. I believe still in the God of miracles. I believe God can still do, you know, amazing things in our lives. God can still heal. God can still do incredible things where it's impossible for man. It's not impossible for God. And so I really believe that, you know, each and every one of us have a testimony. Each and every one of us have a story to tell about how God moved in your life. Maybe it happened a few years ago or maybe it happened this year. But each and every one of us have a story to tell to people And I believe that, you know, it's incredible to see just in this church alone, there's many other churches, but just this church alone, you know, prior Thanksgiving to over, you know, after Thanksgiving, post Thanksgiving, just to continue, you know, getting, you know, reports of people and having their breakthrough, whether it be healing, whether it be just, you know, business, whether it is just finances. I mean, I can go on to just speak about, I'm not going to name names, but in, in this month alone learn about how God has just moved mightily in people regards to healing where they were diagnosed or when there were sus- suspicions of cancer where they went in for tests and they came back and the tests were negative, they were cancer free, you know, and that's for me is just amazing where... You know, people, you know, where they had, you know, an injury, maybe they fell or something happened to them where it looked like, yo, they are just, that's just bad. And then they went in and people just prayed and interceded for the situation. And all of a sudden, miraculously, yes, they might have a bit of a concussion, but it's not actually that bad, if you can call it that. They're still living, they're still alive, and they're still a child of God. We know of people that ask for jobs. They didn't even do go to that company, ask for the job, and the company phoned them and say, hey, I don't know how we got your number, but we're looking for you. Yo, if that's not a miracle from God, then I don't know what we class as miracles. So God can often, you know, move in all these spaces and, and ways. And I love how God, you know, moves in our church. You know, I, I say this because God is good. You know, He's good in all churches, but I want to brag and say He's good in this church. Amen? But we are in this series of calling about the greater harvest. And this, if you've been here last week, we spoke about the greater harvest, the series of talking about what it means about a greater harvest. And we'll unpack it throughout the month of September, what this means. But firstly, I didn't see all the new visitors yet but welcome to each and every one of you. I want to make a special mention to all of you that came for the first time to Sweetwater's Church. Um, you honor us by your presence because you could have been anywhere else this morning. We have some incredible churches all over, but you chose Sweetwater's this morning, and we honor you for your presence here this morning. And we love to meet you after the service for a nice cappuccino um, at the Visitor's Lounge. And even for those who are watching online, from wherever you are watching, God bless you richly, and yet you would just enjoy this service. We miss your presence here, but we know that God will even move wherever you are watching from. Last week, like I said, we started the, the series called Greater Harvest, in line with the vision for us in 2024 that talks about the word greater. And just to give you context to all that especially for those who might be joining us for the first time when we talk about the greater harvest we we said that we're going to be really unpacking about the, the idea and understanding about the four fields the empty field the seeded field the sprouting field or the growing field and then lastly the harvest field and then last week we unpacked and talked about the empty field we spoke about if you were here we spoke about the dry bones can you remember we spoke about the dry bones And today we're unpacking the seeded field, the seeded field. So if you've got your Bibles here, you can turn with me to Matthew 13. The scripture should also be on the screen. And I'm reading from the ESV version. And it says the following, and he told them many things. This is Jesus in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. 
And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they did not de- no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among fawns, and the fawns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And who has ears, he who has ears, let him hear. And that's as far as we read the word this morning. Let us pray as we prepare for God to unpack it to us. Heavenly Father and Almighty God and King, we come before you this morning and we pray, Lord, as we speak about the seeded field, as we speak about the greater harvest, Lord God, and what it means for us as individuals, but also as a community. We pray, Lord God, that you would just unpack and open up the nuggets of your word. And Lord, as always, your servant will decrease and you will increase. We thank you for all you do and continue to do in our lives. We pray, Lord, that your word will cut through the marrow and the bone in order for us to receive new revelation of what it is about the sower. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. The parable that I just read lands besides our lives, almost in a sense like a mirror in which we see ourselves as a window into our hearts. Now this morning, I don't want us to do anything really per se, in today's parable, other than to give it a chance to do something with us. I don't want to try and figure it all out this morning. I want us to let it figure us out this morning and to reveal something about us. I don't want us to interrogate the parable looking for an answer. I want us to listen for the questions it is asking us this morning. I think that is, in essence, what Jesus was trying to allude to when he was saying, who has ears, let him listen. Because sometimes we can try and dissect and try to work things out in our own strength, and our own ability, trying to work it out, when all we need to do at this point in time and this intersection is to just listen and ask ourselves the question, how does this apply to me? And so let's unpack the first part to help us on this road map. In verse 3 it says, a sower went out to sow. And the question we can start off very easily is to ask, who is the sower? Some say it's Jesus sowing the seed of the gospel. Maybe. Others say it's God and not Jesus. They say Jesus is the word or the seed that it God is sowing. And why can't there be More than one sower will be the question. Can there be more than one sower? Can it not just be maybe you and me also included as being the sower? Can it just maybe be Jesus, God, me, you, our family being the sower? And that is the truth that we need, the truth that we need to unpack also this morning. Because if that is true, then we have to ask the next question in this whole thing. If we say that we are sowers, me and you, then I have to ask, what are we sowing? What are you sowing this morning? What are you sowing these days? And what do the seeds you and I are sowing say about us? Our values, our priorities, our concerns. Our relationship with God. And then we come to the next question. Where and with whom are you sowing these days? From whom do you withhold your sowing? Are the seeds you are sowing these days enlarging life or diminishing life? Because oftentimes I want to just quickly get there. I want to just unpack this truth here quickly. Because whenever we talk about sowing and we talk about seed, often our minds go to financial situations. Talking about that we have to sow money. You know, when pastor speaks about sowing, it has to do about money. We talk about seed, we talk about, you know, the seed offering. So it has to be about money. I don't want to go there this morning. It's not about money. I want to just clear it up very quickly. 
And today, the sower is sowing. And he's sowing here, there, and everywhere. Without regard to where the seed might be falling. Or the quality or type of ground on which it falls. The sower sows not because of who or what the ground is. But because of who the sower is. The sower makes no judgment about the quality or the worthiness of the soil. It is not attached to the outcome. Can I say this again? The sower is not attached to the outcome of the soil. Go read for yourself in a parable. He has no judgment or condemnation to the fact that if the soil is hard, then I don't sow there. He still sows. Because why? Because he's a sower. And here's the, the real truth. If we want to really look ourselves in the mirror, can we just speak life now? Can we just be real right now? If we talk about looking ourselves in the mirror, there's probably not, most of us don't live our lives being taught that way, that we don't have any care about what the soil looks like. We still sow. Some of us, we don't work that way. We judge. We separate. And we divide the different soils. So let me talk about the soil. Let me unpack the soil. When I say soil, I can mean community or the area that is involved around us. And sometimes what we do, and hear me out this morning, if you feel judged, just look down. Okay, don't look at my eyes. Just look down. Don't even put your hand up if you, if they like, hey man, that's me. No, no, just put your hand down. But sometimes we take the area community and we look at the area in the community and we're like, yo, we can't go into that community. That community is bad. That community is poor. In that community, there's a lot of crime. We can't go there. Let me just speak about the area because the area is not just a community per se where people live. That area can even represent the place where you work. I cannot speak about Jesus in my workplace. Oh, those people, mm, mm, they don't want to hear about Jesus. Mm -mm. I just go to work and I come home. That's about it. I can't speak about Jesus in my workplace. I can't speak about Jesus in my school. My school doesn't want to hear about Jesus. They want to talk about the Bella thing or whatever. I don't care. They can bella bella somewhere else. I want to talk about Jesus. Amen? Here's the thing, though. Your area and community, what we do in society and what we do now, unfortunately, is, and I didn't want to go there, but I'm going to go, and I know I'm going to be nailed for those who are watching. Don't even cut the feed. That's fine. But your I don't want to nail pastors because I think they're going to nail me now. But we get places and churches that goes and they, they get, 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 get big and then they want to go and they want to go, go get more campuses. And then what they do is they go find places and areas and communities like Polito and Umschlanga and Bluebeck Strand and Santon. And I'm, that's great. If God's called you there, awesome. I'm not going to deny that. But I ask myself this question. Is it not an impoverished community that might benefit more from you planting a church in that area rather than just looking where the money is? Don't applaud for it. No, 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 no. I don't want to sound like I'm judging right now. Please, if you're listening and you're a pastor and you planted a church in Mslanga, that's fine. Praise Jesus. If you reach a community, praise Jesus. But I ask myself, is there not a community out there that we don't see that because of what our natural eyes perceive and say that that's impoverished area because my ministry is going to need money and I can't plant a church there. I can't reach a community there because it's going to cost money. Can I tell you, ministry is going to cost you something. You're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to go into that community because even in a poverty, a poor community needs Jesus. Can I say this again? Even a poor and a poverty community needs Jesus. And I will dare to suggest in that area, your the passion is even much better than places in the Mshanga and Belito and all those places. 
Because there, it is not about how much I have, but how much God I have in me. And I know you're going to walk out of here and you're going to be like, oh, Pastor Kali judge churches. I'm not. <laughs> I promise you I'm not. I'm just asking the questions that need to be asked. Because I want to go into communities. In, and I, Please hear me out. If you're scared, that's fine. I'm not asking you to go with me, but I'm going. I'm going into communities where they say the, the crime rate is so high, don't go there. You need bouncers and protection and all that stuff. I don't care. I have the best bouncer ever. His name is Jesus. Can I tell you, I don't care if they tell me about these witch doctors and all those other things in those areas. I don't care. I will go there because even that witch doctor needs to know about Jesus. I don't care about what the financial outcome is of that place, whether they have money or they don't have money. I still want to go there because ultimately they need to know who Jesus is. That's how you reach communities. That's how you reach the area in your life. Not by judging and saying, I'm not going to go there because the soil is too bad there. Can I go back to the very parable? The sower did not care about the soil. He still sowed. Why? Because it's not up to him. What might start growing or come back to life in people or community if we simply made a decision to sow good seeds without judgment, without resentment, or negative talk? Instead of saying, your dead community is bad, that community is so poor. That community is so wrong. We're going in there knowing that community can be saved for Jesus. There's two things I can draw a line to there. Because we can become almost the Jonas. And hear me this morning. We God has called you into community. We're like, oh, I don't know. That community is bad. And we can almost indirectly go against what God has called you. Because God has called you to go to Nineveh, and we're like, no, I don't want to go there. I'm going to go to Joppa. God will still use somebody else then. He might ask a fish to swallow you up. Hashtag just saying. Or can we almost, in, in another line, we can draw a parable to that is to say, Jesus and the Sumerian woman. If you read the scripture, it says that Jesus had to go. Okay, read it for yourself. Everybody else ignored that place. Because why? Because they, those people are bad. You don't go to that area. And yet Jesus says, I had to go. And there he meets this woman, this Sumerian woman. And yet he just speaks to her. He, he speaks life into her situation. And she goes and she evangelizes to the rest of the community out there. To her very neighborhood that's discarded her. The very community that that's almost you know, put her in exile. One woman he touched, and she reaches the community. But he went into that community. Because if you carry on reading that story, it says that they stayed there. Him and his disciples stayed there for a while. All the sower can do is sow, and all the evangelist can do is proclaim. <laughs> As a pastor, I thought, if I have to think of that someone can be saved because of the jeans that I wear or the type of haircut that I have or how good the coffee is at church. Can I tell you, I will not sleep at night. I'll be honest with you because I'll be more worried about what if I don't come with jeans on Sunday? What if the coffee is not good? Then, then people will be lost. That's a wrong thinking because I can't do anything to save people. It isn't up to me. I can't convert. I can just speak the gospel, share my testimony. The converting part is all upon Jesus. Because it says there, the Lord knows who those who are His. 2 Timothy 2.19 The Lord knows. He knows who He is called. He knows who His people are. Further to this, we see that the sower... And we sometimes miss this part. The sower went out to sow. If he never went out to sow, he would not be much of a sower. Likewise, evangelist is not an evangelist if he does not go and evangelize. 
A farmer cannot produce a crop staying inside the comfort of his home. He must get out of the elements. Likewise, we cannot convert to a world or get Jesus to help us to convert to a world from just the comfort of these walls. That means the mandate, the command for each and every one of us, the challenge for each and every one of us is not just to find comfort here, but go to the uncomfortable places and areas out there so that they can find comfort here. Jesus also explained that the ground on which the seed fell presented the different kinds of reactions they would experience. Now, I'm going to unpack for you a few things there in this, in this parable about understanding what this means about the soil and the sower and the seed that he carries. But just to give you a little bit of an understanding before we move further on, I said to you that the sower is you and me. It represents you and me. And the seed, yes, is the gospel. It's the good news. But more than that, we might ask ourselves, but how do I reach a community? How do I go into the area? I cannot just go there and say, Jesus loves you, and then turn around and go back. It doesn't work that way. We have to have a relationship with the people. Spend time with them. Share your testimony. Share your story about how did you come to know Jesus? How did you know that Jesus saved your life? Can I tell you? I always try to teach people about the understanding about when you meet people for the first time, whether it's in a community or in your workplace, wherever, is find something that you can relate to. Find something that you can relate to. If it is like maybe, and I can use, Kathy, can I use you as an example? Everybody, let me just say, if you knew here, yeah, you will know now. But everybody knows Kathy likes dogs. Okay, it's no secret. She loves dogs. So, if you want to relate to Kathy, can I be honest with you? You have to talk about dogs. Can I tell you, you you'll be her best friend. Gavin, I can put you on the spot here. Gavin likes drumming and all of that stuff. He likes music. So if you want to relate to Gavin, guess what? Talk about drums. Talk about, you know, music. Don't talk about his age. <laughs> but all jokes aside, when you meet people, find out what relates. What, what can you relate to? What, what is their passions? What is something that moves them? What is something that wakes them up in the morning? And then move that into a conversation that you can relate it back to Jesus. And tell me, I can honestly tell you, there's many ways that you can evangelize to somebody by finding something that you can relate to that person. And all around here, I'm talking here, here in this house, each and every one of us can have a discussion with somebody. That's why we talk about the formants of fellowship. You find out about how you can relate to the person, finding out how you can fellowship with the person. But out there, going and finding opportunities, and we're going to have those events. We're going to create those events, those opportunities. We're going to go into the community. We're going to find something that you can relate to the person. And in that, you can then speak about Jesus, the good news. So, there's some principles Jesus explained in the situation of the sower that still, supply, that still apply to us. Number one, if you've got a notebook or something that you can write notes down, you can write this down. You are a sower, not a scarecrow. Okay, there's a picture of a scarecrow here somewhere. Do we have it? Yes? No? Okay, don't stress. Okay, there we are. There we are. Okay, go back to Matthew 13, 4. As he sowed... Some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Let me just say this. It is not your job to guard the seed. It is not your job to do anything but just to sow. It can be tempting to be almost like the scarecrow, trying to protect the Word of God and how people need to react to the Word of God. 
how they need to react appropriately to the Word of God. They need to be, you know, sensitive to the Word of God. They need to be just starting to be disciples the moment you speak about Jesus. They need to be instant, like, you know, get instant doodles. They need to be instant disciples. It is not your job. You are not a scarecrow. You are a sower. See, the thing about a scarecrow is, go back to the picture of the scarecrow. That scarecrow can only go to one place, and that is where he is now. He cannot move. So here's the thing about, if you want to evangelize, you need to move. A scarecrow can only be placed in one place, and that is it. And all he does is guard the seed. Can I tell you what happens when we guard the seed? Sometimes we chase not just the birds, but we even chase the seed away. And God has not called you to be a scarecrow. He has called you to be a sower. And let me just say this. The last time I checked, the Word of God does not need your protection. God doesn't need you to defend Him. He just needs you to represent Him. Oh. Some of us want to go like, oh, but you, you can't say this. You cannot say this. You cannot say this. And then we go on to all these places, there's Facebook, there's this and that. We just, do, 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 do. And so-and-so said this. You cannot say this. This is ugly. The Word of God says this. You cannot do this. Can I tell you, don't even type that. Just do what you do as a Christian. And a person that was actually against the Word of God will see your life and say, sure, something is happening in that person's life. Don't vomit over Facebook. I think I need to just sit down. Ultimately, I'm going to say this. God doesn't need you to defend him. Yes, we get apologetics, but we get the understanding of apologetics is defending your faith. Not trying to defend God. God can defend himself. I mean, he is the creator of the universe. He doesn't need you to go like, oh, you need to protect me. I'm so scared right now. Like, if I, know, I know that guy there, he was saying he's, he's an atheist. He doesn't like me. I need you to go and defend me because I'm worried about that guy. No. Just represent him. Even if that person's an atheist, just show him what a Christian life looks like. Number two, do not expect all seeds to yield fruit. This is an A-N-R-1. And I'm going to explain it now quickly. I don't want to go too long on this. If we're going to go on percentage-wise, and I'm a person of numbers, I like you know, to work on systems and numbers and going through things and looking at how that works percentage-wise. If we're going to go on percentage and the success rate, according to then looking at this parable, this parable shows only 25% of the seed was successful. If you're going to go according to what the parable says, 25% of this harvest or this seed was only successful. That means 75% was unsuccessful. Now it, now it starts opening eyes right now. Because unfortunately, not every good deed is going to come back to us multiplied. See, if you do what is right only because of the results you get from doing good, the moment you do not receive good results, you will have an excuse to stop doing what is good. Because then you'll have an excuse not to go into that area. Because you're going to be like, oh, but that area, I don't know, they're not going to come to Jesus. It's not up to you. Whether one person gets saved, can we praise and, and just cheer them on as loud as we would do if there was 100 people being saved? But let me just change the idea and understanding. Because like I said, the 25%. Because again, we're not working with worldly economics. We're talking about heavenly economics. Go back to verse 8 for me quickly, if you can, quickly jump down. I know I'm asking the media team a lot here quickly. But go to verse 8 for me, because when we talk about natural economics and natural yield, or the farmer's yield versus God's yield, you'll understand something here. The 25% that fell on the good soil, that's the 25% that fell on the good soil, it produced grain some a hundredfold. 
some 60 and 50. So even the 25% miraculously had such a turnaround of multiplication that it become unnatural to the human mind. Because the 25%, even though it was just 25%, produced such a yield that a hundredfold came. Can you understand the, the, the natural economics versus the supernatural economics? We get so, you know, preoccupied by just finding, you know, just, I, I just need to make sure that this is happening. This is happening. That yo, I, these people get saved. Whether they get saved or not, it is just for you to sow and say, let God do the rest. Because He will produce in that one person a hundredfold, a sixtyfold, a thirtyfold. Because that one person will go back into the community and get people to know who Jesus is. Again, I draw an analogy between this and the woman of Samaria because she went back. Jesus just talked about one woman. And then she went back into the community. And the whole community got saved. Let's talk about, no, I don't want to go present because they're not really present. But we talk about Billy Graham. Like him or don't like him, but here's the amazing thing about Billy Graham, the evangelist. One person went to a meeting he didn't really want to go to. Go read the story for yourself. He went because his friend just continued nagging him. And then he went, sat in the back. And then the pastor asking, you know, did a revival. Guess what? Asking people to raise their hands who wants to get Jesus into their life. Who, did you think everybody put their hands up? No. Who put their hand up? Only Billy Graham. Literally, go read the story for yourself. It was only Billy Graham that put his hand up. And then, spoiler alert, guess what? He reaches millions. And we worry about the yield of our lives right now. Number three, the harvest depends on the field, not the seed or the sower. If a seed does not produce a harvest, it doesn't mean that the sower is unqualified. It doesn't mean that the seed is inferior. Most of the time, it simply means that the field it fell on was not ready for it. In the parable, the sower didn't change. The sower didn't go halfway through this whole thing, halfway in the field and says, Oh, I don't know if I'm qualified. I'm just going to go home. He carried on. Let me ask, did the sea change? Did he go back home and go to the storage facility and pack out another packet of seed? He goes like, I don't know, maybe I need to start chucking. The grain is not working. I need to go for sunflower seeds. He didn't. The seed remained the same. What changed? The soil. If a harvest doesn't occur, just make sure it isn't because no seed was sown. That's all you need to be worried about. If you see there's no harvest there, then you need to ask yourself, did you sow any seed in that place? And then if there wasn't any seed sown, then go sow. Doesn't matter about the hill, doesn't matter about the soil, doesn't matter anything about it, just sow. Number three, number four, sorry, number four. Sowing will require effort. Sowing demands attention, time, resources, and energy. Sowing requires effort from the sower. Here's the thing, if anybody ever grew up on a small holding or a farm, guess what? You have to wake up early. While everybody is snug and tiny, like, like when it's, especially winter time when everybody is warm and just, I just want to sleep in and hit the snooze button. The farmer has to wake up very early to attend to the field. And sometimes he attends to the field and he only comes back late at night. And it takes energy. It takes time. It takes sacrifice. Because it would be so much easier just to sit in bed and not do anything. Just to be in comfort place. But if you want to see a harvest, you're going to have to put in effort. You're going to have to put in time. That's why in Galatians 6 verse 9 it says, And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season you will reap. Say it with me, reap. 
if we do not give up. See, if we give up, you will not reap. That's just simple economics. You're going to have to put some time into this. The bank is not coming to stage. Here's the thing. You will never see the greater harvest in your life until, you see, until the seed leaves your hands and is planted on good soil. You cannot ask for a harvest if you have not yet sown the seeds. The seed has to leave your hand. You cannot hold it. You cannot keep it to yourself. Let me put it in a different way. If God has been good to you this year, been good to you and your family, been good into your business, been good to your job, guess what? Don't keep it to yourself. Sow the seed. So go into the community and speak about God's goodness. Go into a community that is impoverished, that sits with unemployment, and go and speak about how your God made a way where there seems to be no way. Some of us, we just want to like, I, 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 can't, I can't share my testimony. I, 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 can't, I just want to keep, this is okay for me just to come on Sundays, Pastor. It doesn't work that way. It's great that you get refueled here on a Sunday, but this is just a refueling station. There's a nation out there that needs to know about Jesus. There's a community that needs to know about Jesus. There's an area that needs to be knowing about who Jesus is. And if they're not going to hear it anyway, they need to hear it from you. You need to go out. <coughs> when talking about the harvest, and especially this morning, talking about the seed, there's an important truth we need to understand. The seed that you sow is not the harvest. But your harvest is locked up in the seed. See, despite the imagery Jesus uses in today's gospel, this parable isn't about farming or gardening at all. You know that, and so do I. It's about us, you and me. It's about our lives, our marriage, our parenting, our friendships. It's about our community and the people we encounter on a daily basis. It's the pain and the needs of the people around us. It's about those who are struggling and holding on by a threat. It's about injustice and the violence we see in our community. It's about living with meaning and purpose. It's about healing, wholeness, and well-being for others as well as ourselves. It's about hope and a future. It's about the coming kingdom of God, the one we really always talk about on Sundays. But it's about sowing the seed of God's word to the world out there. And my challenge for you this morning, will you take up the bold step with me this month in becoming a sower for his kingdom? To reach our community, to share the good news of Jesus because ultimately, each and every one of us have been called to be a sower, to sow the seed of God's good news, to share the good news to the community and the world at large. This church cannot be quiet anymore. I want to be honest with you. This church cannot be quiet anymore. There's a world out there that needs to hear about Jesus. I want to reach nations. I want to reach communities for the greater good. Not for my good, but for the greater good. For King Jesus. Because ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, one day Jesus is going to look to me and he's going to be saying, how many seeds have you sown? How many seeds have you sown? All of us one day is going to come to that place. And I pray we don't get to the place where we say tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. But we get to the place and say today, I make the choice. Not worrying about the soil. Not worrying about what the community looks like. How many negative connotations the, the, the community or the area is. But just to be a so worth for Jesus. To say today, I make the decision and choice to say, Jesus, I will speak about you. 
in those areas. I will find some people for you. And so this morning I put this challenge before you. Are you ready to reach the nations? Okay, that's five of you. Are you ready to reach the nations? Are you ready to reach people, communities, areas for Jesus by sharing the good news, by talking about your testimony, by speaking about how good God has been to you? Can we talk about it? But more importantly, can we take action about it? Our hands and the feet of Jesus needs to be activated. So let's go for it. Can I ask you to stand this morning? God wants to do a work in your life, and He wants to put seeds in your hand. I pray that the seeds you have is to build up and not to diminish life. I pray the seeds that God give you, you'll take good care of it. And as you sow it, not to be a scarecrow, not to worry about the yield, not to grow weary and tired, but to be activated by God and for God and for His community, for His people. And this morning, I pray for an activation this morning into your life. That you will not be worried and concerned to feel that you are not qualified, that you cannot reach nations. That you feel anxious, you're fearful. I pray that God will just release something in you this morning. To open your mouth, to loosen your tongue, to speak into nations, to speak into people. There's evangelists in this, this house this morning. There are prophets in this house this morning. There is pastors in this house this morning. There are leaders in this house this morning. Teachers in this house this morning. There is no shortcoming. No short listing. It is just you. God doesn't have a plan A, plan B, and plan C. He has got you. He, you are His plan. And so this morning, just allow God to minister to you this morning. I ask you to lift your hands this morning. We speak about a greater harvest and we speak about God to just do a, a yield in our lives as we sow the seed. And right now, even this morning, I want to just ask, think about that area that you need to reach. Maybe God is already speaking into you right now as you lift your hands. God is showing you already an area. Maybe it's your workplace. Maybe it's your school. Maybe it's the, the neighborhood that you live, the community that you live in. Maybe it's the friends that you have. Maybe it's even your family. But God is showing you people and communities right now that you need to reach. God doesn't need you to defend Him. He just needs you to represent Him. So when you go into those areas, those places that God is showing you right now, just speak His truth. Just live His life. Just live as a child of God. And see how people will come closer to you, asking the questions about Jesus.